In May 2008, Al Auda, the Palestine Right to Return Coalition, hosted its sixth annual international convention in Anaheim, California, to mark the 60th year of Anakba, which is Arabic for the catastrophe, and refers to the events of 1948, when 750,000 Palestinians were dispossessed of their lands and property. Dr. Ilan Pape is professor of history at Exeter University in England. He is one of the world's leading historians of the Middle East. Among his publications are Britain and the Arab-Israeli Conflict, The Making of the Arab-Israeli Conflict, The Modern History of Palestine, One Land, Two Peoples, The Modern Middle East, and The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine. He is the fulcrum of a group of historians and political scientists at the Cornwall campus of Exeter University, working on 20th century ethnopolitics. The following is the speech delivered by Dr. Ilan Pape at the opening ceremony of the Al Auda Convention. Of course, I, I did agree to the change of the, of the uh, title uh, and uh, a, in solidarity with the protest uh, and the uh, objection, of course, to uh, the Israeli attempt, I, I'll do it. But I feel a bit embarrassed about this change because actually I wrote a whole book in which I claim that the term Nakba is not a good term. <laughs> so you really got me into trouble here. But uh, I'll say that I willingly changed it in order to face the Israelis, but I will change it back to my original title so that I could give the lecture that I wanted to give. And one of the reasons I uh, find the term Nakba disappointing in a way, although I can fully understand uh, its significance and its power as uh, galvanizing for ages and generations the Palestinian memory and activity, is that it's a term of passivity. It's uh, a disaster. It talks about a disaster. And indeed, what happened in 1948 was a disaster. But uh, also the tsunami is a disaster. And an earthquake is a disaster. And there are all kinds of disasters. And what in the human psyche associates with disaster usually is that nobody is responsible for it. Everybody is a victim of it. And this is not what happened in 1948. It was not that kind of a disaster. What happened in 1948 is a crime. So there are criminals, and there there's, are uh, those who are victim, or victims of that crime. And therefore, the term I chose for my book, The Ethnic Cleansing, was to attract attention to the crime itself and to say this happened because a certain group of people decided to do it and it affected a certain group of people and all of these people those who decided to commit the crimes those who were affected by the crime are all known to us and for 60 years we didn't even name them we named the victims but we never named the people who committed the crime. Yes, we called it sometimes the Zionist movement, we called it the Jewish people, we called them the Israelis, but uh, it's far more precise than that. In fact, it's more justified and more politically sound to talk about the people who decided upon the crime and to find out what ideology motivated them to commit the crime, rather than have vague concepts that usually do not allow us to focus our activity in the right direction. I would like tonight to pay attention and focus on three aspects of what happened in 1948 and have a dialogue, conduct a dialogue with you with the, the present. I would go back and forth from the past to the present on three different levels in order to find why the memory of what happened in 1948, why the history of what occurred in 1948 is so important for understanding what goes on today and is very crucial for understanding what should be done in the future. I will talk about the Zionist ideology as it appears in 1948. I will talk about the international community reaction to the events of 1948. 
and I will carefully say something about the Palestinian politics in 1948 and what can we learn from it today as well. Let me start with the Zionist ideology in 1948 and its relevance to what we see uh, today. 1948 in many ways was a culmination of uh, an ideological process which uh, led to an articulation of a very clear formula, concept, which uh, stated that there is no hope for a successful Zionist colonization of Palestine without the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians. This concept was not born in one day. It was not always there at the very beginning of Zionism, although there were some uh, uh, fluid ideas about it. Uh, it was formulated clearly in the mid-1930s, in the mid-1930s, and uh, it was translated into a policy in 1948. We know now from the historical evidence exactly who were the people who uh, formulated these ideas, who were the ones who put forward in a very clear language, with a very clear thinking, the uh, plan to expel by force as many Palestinians as possible from as much of Palestine as possible. The importance of these names is that they are the heroes of Israel today. They all can be found in a pantheon of Israeli heroism. In order to understand what we are facing when we deal with the ethnic cleansing as a crime and the people who directly conceived it, directed it, commanded it, not only the people who executed it on the ground, but the people who, who really uh, thought out all the details and uh, had the terrible foresight that it can work. When we think about the people who are involved, when we mention the names, we have to understand that we are counting, that we are pointing out to the people who are, who are at the heart of the Zionist consensus today. These are people that most Americans know by heart and revere them as great heroes of humanity, democracy, enlightenment, and, modern, and modernity. And, and this is very important, and I think this is why it's so important to know who they were. And I will mention just one of them, because the, uh, the others appear in my book. The founding father of modern Israel, David Ben-Gurion, is the arch criminal. He is the one who really led the whole uh, uh, operation from beginning to end, which uh, ended uh, with the destruction of more than 500 Palestinian villages, 11 towns, and the dispossession of so many uh, people from their homeland. So uh, the Zionist ideology is the motivating force, but you needed human beings, you needed people who would have uh, who, who would execute, who would translate the ideology into actions on the ground. And as it is important to fight an ideological mindset, it's also important to know who are the people who are captivated by this ideology and to see, to see if today we can identify who is behind the Israeli policies of ethnic cleansing that continue, rather than talk generally about Israel, Zionism, Jews, and so on. I think for the sake of building the future state that I think we all want to, to build, we should be very careful not to generalize and rather focus on the people. As much as we don't want to think everybody in the world that President Bush represents Americans wherever they are. So I think in this respect it's very important to study 1948 in minute details not just as a general story. It's to find out when, where, and who was involved in the crime, as good detectives should do in any kind of a crime. The ideological interpretation of Zionism that these leaders and generals had was that 
you need very particular circumstances in order to be able to commit a crime of this magnitude. It's not expelling one village. It's not destroying one town. It's not uh, uh, throwing out uh, 100 people, 1,000 people from the houses. It is a decision to uproot a whole country. Very few politicians and generals in modern history and even in ancient history were that bold to believe that they are that powerful, that they can be that cruel to decide to take a whole country and depopulate it. We have to ask ourselves, how come Jews, three years after the Holocaust, could have been so callous, so determined in committing a crime of such a magnitude. So I think the first lesson we learn by looking at the connection between Zionist ideology, the people who decided about the ethnic cleansing and the operation on the ground, the first lesson I learned at least from the history which is relevant uh, to today is that we should focus our campaign on names and people and not be satisfied with vague concepts. We are not fighting something which we cannot see. Of course we are. I am an anti-Zionist. So we can say we are fighting Zionism, we are fighting Israel, maybe we are fighting a certain group of Jews and so on. But we should be much more specific of what we are doing. We are fighting people who are criminals. And we know their crimes. And we are going to be professionals about it, not just emotional about it. There was one moment of grace in Britain, which I think showed us the way, when General Almog, uh, who was the chief commander in the Gaza Strip and came to a shopping uh, journey to Oxford Street in London, had to stay with the cleaners on the El Al aeroplane because a professional group of activists told uh, the British authorities that they would ask for his arrest for war crimes and he didn't want to risk it. So we should learn the nature of the crimes today as we know the nature of the crimes of yesterday, yesteryears. We should know the names of the people involved in it because we have very little chance of moving forward if we will adopt a very vague language about who is doing what to whom. We should know the name of the victims. We should know the name of the location where the crimes are being committed. We should appear, I think, to be very serious about it and to tell people that, like the Spanish judge who haunts, pin, haunted, now he's dead, haunted Pinochet on every corner in Europe and try to bring him to justice, we will haunt the people the moment we would know who they are. We want the names of the pilots. We want the names of the pilots who drop bombs on the uh, Palestinians in Gaza Strip. We are not fighting the Israeli Air Force. We want the name of the pilots. We want the name of the, and nobody here knows, I can assure you. Nobody here knows the names of the Israeli commander of the Air Force. But he is an arch criminal. And you don't know his name. You should know his name as much as you should know the names of his victims if you want to succeed politically. It's not enough to talk about Israel is committing crimes. It's like talking about America committing crime. It never moved anything, these vague languages. I think we should, we should know that. It's easier to do it as an historian for 1948, I admit. But I think there is a model here that we should adopt for activity and action in the uh, uh, present and in the near future. The second point of view, the second aspect of 1948 which is relevant is the international community's reaction to what happened in 1948. There was a conspiracy of silence. There were so many representatives of the international community on the ground. There were journalists, there were representatives of the United Nations, of the International Red Cross, there were people who, whose 
role and task and mission was to report to their relevant headquarters whether or not peace is being achieved in Palestine after the United Nations adopted the partition resolution on the 29th of November 1947. And they knew that instead of peace, from the 1st of February 1948, Jewish troops were going from one house to the other, from village to village, and were expelling by false people, massacring them when they resisted, and looting everything they had from their material possessions to their cultural heritage, such as books, pictures, photographs, anything they had. Like a locust, they have uh, uh, eaten everything that they have found in their way. And this was seen by many, many people who were not Jews and were not Arabs, who's, who were sent to Palestine to report back home. And they reported back home. We have the reports in the archives. They reported very genuine, very, it's a very genuine report. I can say this as a professional historian. I think that they, have a very, they had a very clear picture of the magnitude of the crime that was committed about the, against the people on the ground. But their headquarters, and it doesn't matter whether it was an edi the editorial board of the New York Times, which had a very industrious journalist, working for them at the time, who was, uh, 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 he, as he was embedded, as you would call it today, with the Jewish forces, and he reported very genuine reports about what was going on. Um, so whether it was the editorial board of the New York Times, whether it was the headquarters of the International Cross in Geneva, or the United Nations Secretariat in New York at the time, they all have received, had received genuine reports of what was going on. And they made a political decision not to publish these reports. They made a, a very conscious decision not to portray the reality on the ground in Palestine because it was the only, the, because there was only one way of depicting it, a crime. And, it, and ethnic cleansing. And it doesn't matter whether they would have used the term ethnic cleansing or not. However they would have chosen to represent or summarize the information that they had received from the ground, there was only one simple story to tell. The Jewish forces, later on the Israeli forces, were systematically expelling the Palestinians from their homes, fields, and businesses. Nobody in the Western world wanted to report that story. And when some historians a year or two later, mainly Palestinians or pro-Palestinians, were trying to say, all right, two years later, may we write an academic dissertation about it? May we tell a story about it, have a play about it? They were silenced too. They, it was suggested to them that so few years after the Holocaust, it's not a good idea to portray the Jews as murderers, expellers, looters, occupiers, and colonizers. This was a conscious decision by the political elites of the West to atone for what Europe did to the Jews in the Second World War. The price was very clear, the dispossession of Palestine. This was the price. It was a simple deal. Instead of facing the real victims the real Jewish victims of the Nazi Holocaust, which was very difficult, it was much better to deal with the State of Israel instead. It's because the State of Israel wanted only one thing in return for the atonement of the political elites of the West and especially of Europe. It wanted the right to dispossess the Palestinians. And this right was granted, first by Europe and later by America, and it should be said it was also granted by the Soviet Union, for those of you who are, have a longing for the Soviet days. It was granted by the Soviet Union as well. In fact, the Soviet Union pro provided the arms with which the ethnic cleansing was committed. Finally, 
There was an interesting gap between the political and other political elite. There was an interesting gap between the Palestinian political elite and the behavior of the Palestinian people on the ground in 1948, which should teach us a lesson about what goes on today. One has to preface that and say, of course, that because of the events of 1936 to 1939, the Palestinians in many ways were quite leaderless in 1948. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to, to, to think about other chapters in Palestinian history when they were not leaderless. But in 1948, they were particularly leaderless. And the leaders who were they were mostly in exile found it very difficult to have a united language and a united position, and more or less surrounded their, uh, surrendered, I'm sorry, surrendered their uh, leadership to the Arab League and its leaders. And in fact, if any Palestinians who lived in 1948 on the land of Palestine would have listened to the Palestinian politicians in 1948, worse would have happened. One has to say the truth. They had no idea what to do. They didn't know what to say to their people, even those who had some communication with their people. And uh, they found it very difficult to formulate a position towards an event they did not anticipate. Of course, people now know what can happen. This is the big advantage that we have on 1948. We know what Zionism is all about. I think we understand that the, st the strategy of all the governments of Israel, of all the political parties of Israel, regardless of their uh, uh, position in this charade of an Israeli rainbow of ideas, which n doesn't really exist. And we still don't have a united Palestinian leadership. We don't have an address. I've been an activist for the Palestine cause, I think, for more than a quarter of a century, even before that. And if I have to answer questions, especially in initial meetings with people I want to recruit to the Palestine cause, and I would have to give them an address who should they write to, phone or fax or text, so that they would know what the Palestinian leadership wants us to do? What does it expect us to do? Do you know the address? I don't know the address. We are in a dismal situation where when I go and call for boycott of Israel in London, the Palestinian embassy calls me to say that Basically, I'm right, but they're not sure this is the right direction. So I have to ask, what is the Palestinian leadership position on boycott? What is the Palestinian leadership position on the right of return? What is the Palestinian leadership position on the one-state solution? How far do they want us to go in the struggle against Zionism and Israel? Do they want us to support the peace process? Do they want us to support the uh, next Annapolis uh, uh, conference? We have to solve these problems. We cannot be bystanders, whoever that we are, Jews, Palestinians, Americans. If we are part of that impulse to change the, rea the oppressive reality in Palestine, we all have to say that we need a compass. We all have an individual compass, I'm sure. Some of us have spiritual compasses, which is good. We should all have them. But we need a, a mega compass for all of us, and we don't have it. The Palestinians didn't have it in 1948, and they still don't have it in 2008. So when we learn the history of 1948, we also should learn, and, and I don't have a formula for you, I don't have a magic formula for you how to do it, but I'm just saying we have to learn the need to find the compass. And some people say, and I think I understand where it comes from, 
let's put aside the debate between two states and one state. Let's put aside the debate between the Hamas and the Fatah. Let's put aside the debate between the inside and the outside. Let's put aside the debate what kind of a state we want. If we continue to put all these debates outside, we will be outside as well, eventually. I think this is part of the struggle. Not to defeat each other if we don't agree about something, but to find the golden mean how to work together on this. But not to hide these things. To find a compass for the next generation of the people who would form the next Solidarity Committee with Palestine. If something is to be learned from the uh, ANC struggle and the anti-apartheid movement in uh, Europe and in America was the clear orientation it has received from the ANC. And it was very, very uh, important. And I say this because I really, really, really believe that um, a clear orientation and clear answers to these questions we, which we keep saying we'll put aside because we have to move forward. A real answers to these questions will also help us to uh, realize our dream of return, of ending the Zionist regime, of creating a new reality in Palestine for all of us. I really believe in it because I think that it's not enough, and it, as, as important as it is, is to feel that eventually evil projects comes to an end, which is true. But for the sake of the people of Gaza, for the sake of the people in Jenin, we don't have the luxury of waiting for this historical lesson to happen just by itself. For their sake, we should find the energy and the power to overcome the internal strifes, to find a direction that would suit all of us, even if we'll take a whole year to discuss it, and to tell ourselves that we have the kind of leadership we all want and we all need in order to change the reality for all of us. Thank you very much.